Well, any situation can be looked at from a point of view that reveals the whole fractal. In other words, what it's saying is experience is holographic on one level, but linearly sequential on another level. In a way, this leads into, or this is a continuation of this discussion of death. Because if we leave off the historical modeling and turn toward the modeling of an individual life with the time wave, then again, there is a message of hope. It says the most novel and amazing thing that will ever happen to you is the last thing that will ever happen to you. And I would like to believe that. I would like to believe that we gather our experience, we become wiser, we meet people, life becomes more novel, we have children, they have children, we have success, we have failure. Our life, you just get, if you're living right, your life should just get more and more baroque, beautiful, complicated, mysterious, and then you die. And then it really gets interesting. <laughs> Uh, that's what I'm, that's what this all seems to want us to believe. Let's put it that way. This is death, and then people say, well then if, if the world is fractal, if then is it not true that the evolution of an individual could be extrapolated to be the evolution of the whole system? And then that leads to the mildly unsettling possibility that what this great transition we're moving toward is, is not uh, T1 for everybody, but D1 for everybody. In other words, death. Death is the thing that really stirs us. We don't know what it is. We don't know whether we're supposed to flee from it or race toward it. Uh, and people say, well, then is it possible that, just to take the date 2012 as a mark, is it possible that everyone would die? It's possible. Uh, I've looked a lot at asteroid impactors because the people who study these things know that this is not an act of God or a miracle, that this happens. It has happened. It will happen, and it happens on different scales, from things like meteor crater in Arizona 50,000 years ago. Everything within 800 miles of that impact died instantly 50,000 years ago. But 65 million years ago, an object the size of Manhattan impacted in the Gulf of Campeche, and nothing on this planet larger than a chicken walked away from that. Well, now, if you talk about ecological disaster, there's never been one like that in the history of the planet. Thousands, tens of thousands of species died. Entire orders of animals were wiped out. The continents were rearranged. But guess what? The flowering plants, of which we are so fond, and our own dear selves, of which we are even more fond, would never have had a chance to insinuate themselves into the evolutionary life of this planet had there not been that clearing out of the reptilian climax. So then you look at this and say, well, was this the greatest mass extinction in history or the greatest leap forward for biology in the history of the planet? And the answer is, it was both. Out of enormous death comes an enormous surge in the domain of organic novelty. Uh, I prefer to think that it is not a planetary catastrophe or a mass dying. And I'll, I'll tell you why. And this is a place, this is now we're working from the notebooks. In other words, this is not prepared for public consumption. This is something I meditate on in the baths. I can't help but notice that as novelty increases in time, according to this model, that the spatial domain of its focus narrows. 
So, for instance, in the early phase of the time wave, the the stars are condensing and the galaxies are forming. We could say that the entire universe is moving toward novelty. But once carbon chemistry appears, the cycles of fusion in stars and production of heavy elements and things like this are stabilized. And the domain of novelty becomes biology. And for a billion and a half years, biology evolves and adumbrates its forms and moves from the prokaryotes to the eukaryotes to the multicellular. The conquest of the land begins. But then, uh, with the emergence of language using and tool using higher primates, in a sense, novelty leaves the domain of organic life. And organic life becomes metastable and evolution and mutation happens. But where the action has moved to is in to the epigenetic domain entirely defined on this planet by human activities. And so the human beings are the carriers of novelty. And that has gone on until about, um, oh, pick a number, but basically 3,000 to 2,500 years ago. And then the novelty seems to concentrate itself in southern Europe. The Greeks take some kind of step that no other people have ever taken. You know, even today, if you go around the world and visit tribal people and ask to see their art, they show you, if you ask to see depictions of human beings, they show you symbolic depictions of human beings. That's what an African mask is. That's what a Sepik River carving is. These are symbols of human beings. The Greek mind crossed an invisible boundary. And somebody said, let's take a block of marble or some clay and let's not symbolize a human being. Let us make a perfect topological simulacrum of a human being, a face that looks like a face, flesh that looks like flesh, it was as though the Greek consciousness rose to the surface and left the unconscious behind and the eyes were open and no longer saw through symbolic filters, but instead said nature in and of itself. This is the foundation for science and art as we know it. So the novelty then was largely in the hands and largely, I'm rushing here, exceptions are obvious, in the hands of what we call the Greco-Roman mind. And, uh, and so it has been for a couple of thousand years. We'll then pick a number, a uh, hundred years or so ago. It, it further contracted the novelty. It further contracted itself into the high-tech industrial democracies. And now it has further retracted. One of the problems we're having in our society is there's a bifurcation going on in society. Part of us are going with the new novel technologies that knit us together and make us dimensionless telepathic creatures through the Internet. And some people are digging in their heels and saying, oh, no, no, beyond newspapers, I can't go. Uh, and so those people are being left behind. They are practicing old-style culture in an equilibrium state. So now it isn't even all of the high-tech populations of the industrial democracies. As we get closer to 2012, if this process uh, proceeds, then the source of novelty will constrict even further. And I guess... It may eventually come down to one or two people or a group of people, and maybe those people will make a machine. And then 
the machine will be the source of the novelty, and all of us will be put out to the pasture of equilibrium and maintain the rest of the world as it was, but the novelty will have focused to some kind of incredibly intense point. And so, looking at it from that model, it's hard to see how it could be an asteroid impact or something like that, because that would affect all biology, all geology. It would completely violate this long-standing tendency of the novelty to um, uh, concentrate itself. Well, now the Buddhists have an interesting perspective that maybe has something to do with this. There are many schools of Buddhism, and I don't want to get into the that, but uh, there are schools which hold the following doctrine, that if a single person could attain enlightenment, then all sentient beings in the cosmos would attain enlightenment instantly. In other words, that only one person or one being has to break through the boundary for the entire state system to collapse and rearrange itself. It's December 21st, 2012, and through the worldwide VM, VRML hookup of the internet, everybody with an IQ above 10 has gathered in the great collective space to witness the first attempt to send a human being through time. And uh, at the World Temporal Studies Institute at La Chirera in the Amazon, uh, the president of so-and-so makes a speech. The lady time traveler makes a speech. She straps on her helmet. She steps into the machine. The fanfare for the common man is played. A button is pushed. And uh, off she goes into the future. Now, what has always been put against time travel schemes is what's called the grandfather paradox. And this is easy to understand. It goes like this. If time travel were possible, I could travel back in time and <clears throat> kill my grandfather. If I did that, I wouldn't exist, so I couldn't do it. Therefore, there's a closed loop of paradox. Therefore, time travel is impossible. I put this to the mushroom, and it said, well, uh, time travel is possible, but you can only travel backward in time as far as the moment of the invention of the first time machine. You can't travel further back in time than that because there were no time machines before that. So... It's a kind of barrier. Well, so then I thought, mm. so then here was my model of what would happen when the lady tempo knot sails off into the future. Let's forget about her and ask the question, what happens next in our world? And my first guess was what happens next is Thousands and thousands of time machines arrive from all points in the future. They have come back through time to witness the first time machine take off. It's as though you had a Piper Cub that you could fly to Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, to that windy morning in late December when the Brothers Wright rolled it out of their bicycle shop and fired her up. And then I said, well, but wait a minute. We haven't dealt with the grandfather paradox. One of these time machines from the distant future on its way to the first time flight could stop off and kill the grandfather of the driver of that time machine. And we haven't gotten anywhere at all. So then I, I produced a slightly more complicated model, but... At the, but it works, and so here's, here's what it is. It's that because the future is not what we think it is, uh, well, here's, a, here's a, a, a metaphor which makes it more clear. 
in this world that we're living in right now, we have people such as Bill Gates and his research and development teams. And we have people such as the upriver people in Don that I spent time with, bare-assed people living at a very minimal cultural level. Gates and his people and this, this Amazon tribe occupy the same planet and the same moment in history. But who is influencing who? Very few people in the world are taking up the Amazonian lifestyle or point of view. Millions and millions of people are going Gates direction, and more and more will. So what I concluded from that is that advanced states of culture tend to squeeze out or mitigate less advanced states of culture. Now let's return to the time flight. What happens when the lady at Temponaut goes into the future is not that time machines arrive from all over the future. What happens is that the entire rest of the history of the universe happens instantly. In other words, a future evolutionary developments, conquest of the galaxy, vast technologies that allow star flight and wormhole travel and all that, the fruits of all that are delivered instantly to our doorstep in 2012. I call it the God Whistle model. In other words, we end the whole thing. We, we collapse the state vector and everything goes into a state of novelty. And, it's a, and what happens then, I think, is uh, the universe becomes entirely made of light. This is a sort of the cherry on the cake. You know that there is uh, something in physics called the principle of parity. This is that particles can appear out of nothingness as long as they appear in pairs such that after a certain period of time, the two pairs and not the, the two portion, the, the members of the pair encounter and annihilate each other. And when this happens, physicists say parity is conserved. Now, it's known in quantum physics that there is a phenomenon called vacuum fluctuation. A uh, vacuum fluctuation is a situation where in absolutely empty space, suddenly out of the quantum subspace, particles jump into existence. They follow trajectories, they encounter each other, they annihilate each other, parity is conserved, and so it's okay. It's okay. Well, so then you talk to these quantum physicists and you say, well, well, how large can one of these vacuum fluctuations be? And they say, well, most of the, they last milliseconds, nanoseconds. You say, well, is there a theoretical upper limit on the size of a vacuum fluctuation dictated by theory? And they say, no, no, no. It's simply that the longer the fluctuation lasts, the rarer it is. So in other words, the longer a fluctuation lasts, the less likely you are to encounter one. Well, then you say, well, is it possible that this entire universe is such a vacuum fluctuation? You say, well, yes, but that would be very rare to have such a long one. You say, well, hell, you only need one. <laughs> Calculating the probability of a unicate event is a fool's game. I mean, it's either 100% sure or zero sure. It's, uh, so, uh, so here is a model, and I took this from the Swedish physicist Hans Alfven, who hasn't gotten enough credit, but who's really a very interesting thinker. Imagine that the universe is this kind of vacuum fluctuation a 17 billion year long vacuum fluctuation. Well, what it means then is that at the Big Bang, not one universe was born, but two. 
and they sailed off into super spaces and have no connectivity with each other, or they have bell non-local connectivity or something. But anyway, they are distinctly separate. And But they are unbeknown to each other on a collision course with each other. Parity must be conserved eventually. And a model like this holds open the possibility of the instantaneous transformation of the entire cosmos because the collision of these two universes would not occur in three-dimensional space. It would occur in a higher dimensional space. So this cosmological model holds out the possibility that all matter in the universe could be instantaneously canceled in this encounter with the antimatter twin that was born at the beginning of the cosmos. Okay, if you're still following, we're almost to pay dirt. Every particle known to physics possesses an antiparticle, which is locked into this parity-conserving thing I've laid out for you, with one exception, one astonishing and amazing exception. The photon has no antiparticle. There is no antiphoton. So this universe that is on a collision course with itself in hyperspace, at the moment of the conservation of parity, all matter vanishes. And what is left is a universe made entirely of light. And we have no model, for, or I have no model, uh, for a universe made of light. There would be no gravity, because gravity is a property of matter. Such a universe could be modeled. And then the question is, well, then what would happen to forms? What would happen to your body, my body, this planet? The answer is, no one can know. But it is very interesting that the esoteric traditions of nearly every religion uh, talk about light. A great deal. Talk about ascent to the light, cultivation of the light, the after-death vehicle as a thing made of light. So uh, I just put this out here because it occurred to me. My imagination in an effort to make the assumptions of novelty theory congruent with the known laws of physics, I discovered, you know, this sounds like wild hair stuff, but no violation of the known laws of physics is involved in this scenario. So perhaps what enlightenment is, is it happens to an entire universe when it drops its matter and antimatter out of its, uh, out of its structure and it becomes entirely made of light. That would certainly fulfill uh, the novelty theory. Anyway, that's enough of that malarkey. Well, you see, the way the novelty theory is structured is you have this wave, uh, and it is iterated on different scales. And iteration, if you have a given level, let's call it A, above A is a larger level that is a times 64. Below A is a smaller level that is 1 64th of A. And wherever you are in the hierarchy, this is true. Levels above, 64 times larger. Levels below, 64 times smaller. Well, modern astrophysics says they're arguing about it right now, but the universe is between, is under 20 billion years old. Everybody agrees on that. And the question is, is it 9, 12, 13, 14? But it's under 20. The, the time wave has a cycle, the largest cycle I have found necessary, except for the prime number research, is a 72 billion year cycle. So let's call that the top cycle, the A level, a 72 billion year cycle, plenty of time to, for the universe to 
evolve to its present state. Below that level is a cycle 1 64th that size. What would that be? Roughly 1.2 billion years. At the initiation of that cycle, uh, uh, I don't know, some dramatic thing happens in biology. Below it is another cycle. Uh, if, if the B level is 1.2 billion years, then the next level is 1 64th of that. I think it's roughly 275 million years. Next cycle, um, divided by 64, whatever it is, uh, 750,000 years. Uh, next cycle, and you see where I'm going. Well, eventually you get to a cycle that's 4,306 years in duration. That is basically the cycle of late history. I mean, certainly there was history before 4,000 years, but the continuous march of global civilization over the last 4,000 years. Well, then the next cycle down is only 67 years long. And I mentioned it last night, from 1945 to 2012, each cycle begins with a bang, literally. Uh, below the 67-year cycle, there is a 384-day cycle. And, I, and that, is, that will run from late 2011, somewhere in November 2011, to the end of 2012. <clears throat> And I call that the year of the jackpot. It's a 13-month year. But the entire history of the universe will be reprised in that 384-day period. Well, then comes a six-day cycle. By this time, either I will have gently bowed out or the entire world will be aware of what is happening because the novelty will be so intense. Imagine a six-day cycle in which the entire previous 67 year, 4,306 year, up to the top level are all being compressed and replayed in six days. Well, then comes the hour and 35 minute cycle. Then comes the minute and a half cycle. Then comes the 1.3 second cycle. Now, at that point, 1.3 seconds, if we assume that the cycles cannot be iterated beyond the level of Planck's constant, which is 6.55 times 10 to the minus 23rd erg seconds, the way for you to think of that is as a jiffy. Uh, it's, the, it's the grain of the universe. We don't feel the need to go be, to discuss lengths of time shorter than that because there aren't lengths of time shorter than that. Time comes in those packets of that size. Uh, well, if you're at 1.3 seconds cycle, you still have 13 cycles to go through before you reach the realm of Planck's constant. And you have come through. 13 cycle. So the universe is only half done 1.3 seconds before its end. That's why asking what will happen in 2012 is preposterous. The mind fails. Half of the universe's evolutionary unfolding will occur in the last few milliseconds of its existence because of the asymptotic acceleration of the expression of novelty. So it's this thing which began very gently, very stately, the march of the atoms, you know, the condensation of the stars and the galaxies, the emergence of biology, the emergence of higher animals, the emergence of... and just into then a screeching photo finish where all the stuff is bundled together, squeezed together, connected, transformed, lifted into higher dimensions. And see, this is not a process we can take responsibility for or discuss our guilt or innocence. This is the cosmos itself tearing loose from its previous 
constraints and moving ever faster toward ever greater freedom with ever more appetite and momentum until it is it achieves its goal, which is infinite novelty throughout all space and time, holographic connectedness, God mindedness, you know, whatever your vocabulary is, yeah. Oh, yeah, this is a completely legitimate move. I mean, it's mind-boggling to think of this in human scales of time, that half of the universe's becoming occurred in a few milliseconds. But dig the fact that is the position of orthodox physics as we sit here. It's simply that they say it happened at the beginning. I say it'll happen at the end. What they're saying in physics now is that the universe came in, the Big Bang occurred, and then some, you know, a few nanoseconds after the Big Bang, there was this thing called the inflationary expansion phase. It lasted a few nanoseconds, and in those few nanoseconds, the universe became several order, uh, tens of orders of magnitude larger than it was. So it's a it's a legitimate move in physics, however counterintuitive it may seem uh, on the human scale. Yeah. Have you worked with the many worlds? Well, the problem with the many worlds theory is it just it violates the principle of parsimony. In other words, that is not the simplest explanation. That's an. Inc- Do you all know what this is? It's the idea that whenever a process in the universe encounters a bifurcation point, that it goes both ways. In other words, and and so the multiplication of possibilities in a situation like that is staggering, and I just don't see, I just don't feel the need for it. If I understood Wheeler's mathematics better, I might, but that theory has been around since the middle 70s, and he has a very respected position at Princeton, but he doesn't seem to be able to sway his colleagues, which doesn't mean he's wrong. I'm just saying uh, it it's a bit Baroque for my taste. Well, once beyond the zero point, by definition, novelty must mean the simultaneous realization of of bifurcations of all sorts. In other words, what ultimate novelty must mean is anything we say it means. Uh, there, are, there are no limitations when novelty soars to infinity. The universe is a series of impediments to the expression of novelty. And when it has overcome all those impediments, there is a flawless, higher dimensional matrix throughout all being, I guess, is how you would put it. Yeah. No, that's another can of strings. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's a different thing and more exotic. There's a lot of this stuff going around. You know, I, I am by no means the strangest cat on the block. Is this guy Alan Guth, have any of you looked at his website? This is a guy at, who's being paid a salary by MIT, for God's sake. And his thing is all about m- making universes. And he says we can make universes and put them on the shelf. Know, made this one in February, botched that one in March, and uh, talks about how the ultimate proof of the direction in which modern physics is moving is to make a universe. After all, if, if they begin from an area smaller than the diameter of the hydrogen atom, a major laboratory could just stamp them out like hotcakes. Of course, the question is, what are they good for? Uh, what do you do with a universe once you've made one? But a, as an exercise in the imagination, I, you know, take a look at what this guy is into. Uh, 
let me just try to sum this up, not certainly to sum up the ideas, because the ideas are not really that important. They may be true, they may be untrue, they may reside in a domain where those rules don't apply. The feeling that I hope you take away from all of this, when you are most self-reliant, you know, maybe you don't understand 10-dimensional vector calculus then don't use that tool to understand. Hone the tools that you have and try to create models and understand that all models are provisional. This is the antidote to the idea of ideology. Ideology is, is when you believe something passionately. Models are when you dispassionately attempt to define the operation of a system. And the word model implies that you are perfectly willing to discard the model when a better model comes along. I mean, get a grip, people. Where is it writ in adamantine that talking monkeys should be able to understand the universe? If you met a termite who told you that he was on a quest to understand the universe, a certain lip-curling cynicism would <laughs> ensue. Well, do you think you're better positioned than that termite to undertake that? So the thing is to understand what one understands and then to build outward from that. And the tools are mathematics, drugs, attention to phenomena intuition, community, and inspiration. And uh, these things may not solve your marital problems or uh, increase your earning power, but they will put you in touch with the larger dynamic of being. I think being is most appreciated when it is understood. That's why worship raises my hackle. Worship is, is what animals do to the mystery because they can't assimilate or understand it if they even deal with it at all. But true religiosity is a man is, is uh, signified by honest intellectual efforts to model and understand. And it's by that process that we increase um, our connectivity to the universe and the depth and richness of our connectivity to our community. That's what it really is all about. That's our glory to understand, to model, to describe, to explore, to appreciate. So meet me at the waterfall at the top of the